about the student voter guide. Well, thanks everybody for uh, for joining. I appreciate it. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Dan Vicuña. I'm a staff attorney and campus vote project coordinator at the Fair Elections Legal Network. Um, Fair Elections Legal Network is an organization dedicated to reducing barriers to voting for traditional and underrepresented communities. So we've been doing this work for several election cycles now, and you know, after doing it, you know, very quickly we, we discovered that there were particular barriers to voting and, and registration that that really did affect called students. Uh, more than other voters, um, you know, as kind of new voters who are new to the process, uh, they didn't necessarily, um, you know, have the information they needed to cast a, a ballot, uh, to register and cast a ballot. So, as a result, we created Campus Vote Project, which is a uh, uh, proud to be a partner of the Andrew Goodman Foundation. We're looking forward to doing great work this election cycle together. Um, CVP, uh, as you can see there, is a campaign to empower students and college administrators with the tools they need to reduce barriers to voting on college campuses. Um, you know, the, the problem is that there's about a 19 percentage point difference between the voting rates of Americans who are between 18 and 24 and those who are 30 years of age or older. And you know, you've all probably heard the stereotypes that purport to explain this difference, that young people are lazy, apathetic, really just don't care enough about government or governance uh, or their community to get involved. Uh, we, we've learned that that's really a gross oversimplification and just dead wrong. In fact, the truth about young voters is, as I mentioned, the problem is that they're new voters, and you know, being not having not gone through the process before, there, there's a lot of information they have to know to kind of jump through the bureaucratic hoops. Um, and in fact, in the 2010 election, uh, two thirds of college students who are between the ages of 18 and 24 who didn't vote uh, really cited lack of information about the process. You know, not, didn't know what their rights were in terms of residency, scheduling problems, like really reasons that had more to do with an information deficit than an interest deficit. Uh, and in fact, there are a ton of polls you can look at that show that young adults really do believe they can make a difference in America. Uh, you know, it, just one example is a Rock the Vote poll showing that 83% of young adults stated their generation has the power to change the country. Um, you know, we also know from a, an organization called Circle that does great work, uh, research on terms of youth civic engagement, that 87% of students who actually jumped through the bureaucratic hoops uh, to register um, actually showed up. So, you know, if students are empowered with the information, they will show up. Uh, so I'm just going to go quickly through some of the what are the particular the sp specific barriers that tend to affect students when they're trying to participate in our political process. Um, uh, first is residency. You know they may they may be new to the community, new to a state even, and they don't necessarily they don't know what the, what the rules are. You know what am I allowed to do? Um, you know that's a problem. So they're kind of maybe intimidated at, away from from participating. Uh, voter ID, which is an issue in some states, uh, could be problematic in terms of um, Proof you need to, to register to vote in the first place, or in, or in many states, you know there there are restrictions on um, voting based on what you have, what you take to the polls with you. Um, sometimes student registration and voting is discouraged. Uh, you'll find some very odd views occasionally um, in local election offices that have to do with uh, that that um, uh, that really demonstrate kind of a hostility towards student voting. I guess you might say. Um, which is unfortunate. Um, Off-campus polling places for students who um, may be, again, new to the community or maybe carless. Um, they don't necessarily, uh, you know, know the, their way around the local community, so if a polling place is far away, that can be a barrier. Um, insufficient resources to handle student voters. Sometimes college communities, they, you know, they're unprepared for an influx of, of student voters, and, you know, they just, they, you know, that results in long lines, and that, that's a big problem. Um, poll workers that are unfamiliar with student issues. Um, in a lot of places, there are some school-generated documents that can be used to um, to actually to cast a ballot, to register. Uh, but poll workers may not know that, may not know the law well, so that's also a problem. Uh, and there are some myths as well that we're going to address kind of one by one that r really uh, intimidate students from uh, registering and voting locally. Uh, there's also been, unfortunately, some um, specific kind of legislative attacks on students' rights. Uh, just to give a few examples, um, in New Hampshire, uh, there was an att attempt to redefine domicile to keep students from voting college communities in particular. It was aimed at out-of-state college students. Um, in fact, that was just overturned by a, by a court decision in the last couple of days. Um, 
uh, the House Speaker, in justifying greater restrictions on college students voting, said, you know, young people, they vote liberal. They don't have life experience. They just vote their feelings. He also called them foolish in the speech uh, in front of a Tea Party organization. Um, in Maine, the Secretary of State there exa uh, basically examined whether uh, college students who were originally from out of state were paying out of state tuition. Um, uh, they, they, there were about 200 or so who voted locally in Maine. He accused them of wrongdoing uh, in, in voting locally, investigated whether they, that was illegal, it de determined in fact it was perfectly legal, which the, uh, a quick look at the law would have given away uh, you know, fairly simply. Um, nonetheless, he sent intimidating letters to them implying that they had broken the law, despite the fact they hadn't. So, um, Texas, just kind of quickly, this is um, one of the stranger cases. There was a new, uh, new voter ID law passed by the state legislature. Um, however, it's not in effect because it was struck down by the Department of Justice or denied preclearance. Um, it allowed it allows voters to use as voter ID a concealed handgun permit, but not a student ID. So that's kind of the lay of the land in terms of what students are up against. Yeah, but why is this important? Um, I mean, since you're looking at a huge influx of new voters, since the last presidential election, there have been nine and a half million citizens that have turned 18. Um, young people generally, uh, adults under 30, make almost a quarter of the voting population. Um, in addition, we know that voting becomes a habit, that really one of the greatest predictors of whether a person will cast a ballot in, in a particular election is whether they did so in the previous election. Uh, civic participation really does become the kind of a way of life, a, 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 a way of practice for, for people if they start early and young. Um, of course, there's kind of a practical purpose as well. Um, higher education budgets across the country are just are just getting killed uh, in the state legislature. Um, you see there, 35 states made cuts in the last fiscal year. Um, and just a couple specific examples of what that's resulted in. You know, it, it seems like it would really be to the advantage of, of colleges and universities to have, to see their students as a, you know a, a voting an important voting voice when these decisions are being made at the legislative level. Um, in addition, you know, just some a piece of information that's useful for you to be armed with is that um, all, most colleges and universities are required under federal law to provide voter registration information to students. Uh, you know, they're required to make a good faith effort to distribute a mail voter registration form and to make such forms widely available to students. And a recent uh, um, amendment to that law uh, allowed that uh, um, electronic distribution uh, to, um, you know, that would conform with the Higher Education Act. So sending out a mass email to students uh, with links to forms and voting information would also do the trick. Um, so let me just kind of give you quickly what the, the primary resources we have at our disposal to help you are. Um, at campusvoteproject.org we have a, a toolkit that lays out in, real, in really specific detail you know, what are the particular things that students can work with administrators and faculty to implement on college campuses to make sure that your classmates have the information they need to cast a ballot this year, you know, the particular programs and reforms. And we're going to go through a few of those that are going to be um, come the most in handy uh, in the last uh, where we're five or six weeks before Election Day. Um, in addition, at FairElectionsNetwork.com, we have state-specific guides on things from voter registration drives, uh, early voting dates and deadlines, GOTV, uh, important, most importantly maybe for your purposes, st a student voting guide that's state-specific that lays out the most important information in just a couple of pages and debunks some of the myths that, that may keep students from participating. Um, and, and, you know, we can sort of turn those into any kind of, um, you know, training or something on campus if, that, if that's useful to you. Or do webinars for administrators, faculty, uh, other students, whatever may be helpful. Um, in addition to communications collaboration, you know, we want to put a spotlight on great work that's being done so that we can share that as, as best practices with other schools around the country. So, you know, it, we'll ha we'd be happy to kind of share what you're doing in press releases, uh, and, you know, help you set up any kind of press events if, if you're going to do that. Um, brag about you on you know on, on our blog we'll let you blog in fact even be, it would probably the better way to go uh, you know and use our social media platforms to kind of discuss the, the great work you're doing at Twitter campus vote and on our Facebook page um, so just to, this is kind of a quick overview of the campus vote project toolkit the specific areas that we go into I'm not going to cover all of them um, in this because some we've really kind of passed the deadline for implementing these are more long-term uh, strategies um, however uh, you know just so you'll know what's there 
uh, what kind of information you can get, what kind of advice. Um, these are the various toolkit items that you can check out at campusvoteproject.org. So I'm going to start with the, the first toolkit item, which is election awareness campaigns. This is a huge thing that you can do between now and the election. Uh, we, you know, we've already started to work with, with a ton of different schools to basically put in one place um, you know, all the information, either in an email that can get blasted out to all students, or even better, a website. Um, you know, so that that has you know that can be linked to throughout the school website. Uh, but you know, but one example, campus-wide emails. You know, it's one one quick email that says, "Here's the registration deadline. This is when early voting starts. This is the kind of ID you need to register and/or uh, when you go to the polls." Um, other election awareness campaigns. You know, candidate forums and debates. You know, and invite. Invite some folks, uh, you know, local candidates uh, or um, onto campus to be questioned directly by students. Um, Nonpartisan election rallies is some of the work uh, you know you guys have done already, which has been outstanding. Um, you, you may time this to start. You may at the beginning of early voting to do a march to the polls together, um, which would be fantastic. Um, classroom announcements, you know, peer-to-peer -peer recruitment and this kind of in civic engagement is is still incredibly essential, despite all the great work we can do online through social media. Uh, you know, just making a pitch directly, asking professors for a couple of minutes before uh, school starts, you know, at the start of early voting or in the last couple of weeks of the election to encourage people to make sure they know where their polling place is or that their registration went through, things like that. Uh, campus media, again, this is something that we, we've already done in Ohio. We're sending, um, you know, press releases to, uh, to kind of tar about 20 states um, in Ohio. We're probably going to work on Pennsylvania next. Um, to let them know, you know, caps newspapers to say, you know, here's the important, here's you know the important dates and deadlines. This is an early voting starts, ID requirements. Just again, the basics for, that are really essential in the last six weeks of the campaign. And if if gathering that information um, or you kind of putting that in a release is something that we can be helpful with to you, uh, you know, we've already started to do it. So um, you know, please take advantage of our of our help. Uh, just a few creative kind of election awareness examples I've seen. Um, you know, it's at Central Michigan University, there was a, a, a turbo a commercial basically produced with featuring student athletes on campus, and um, students um, asked for permission to put that commercial up on the turbotron at halftime of a football game, which was a really great way to raise awareness. Uh, at Denison University um, in Ohio, they went with you know put kind of the basic few bullet points on what people needed to know during the GOTV period on door hangers and plastered them all over campus um, and art. Class held a bit of a, a competition to see you could have the coolest looking vote poster, and they were uh, they were massive and placed throughout the campus commons. Um, at Eastern Michigan University, that students wore orange armbands just as a kind of a discussion piece, you know, and they wrote down on their armbands what what issue they cared about. You know, some person uh, might say environment or uh, jobs or choice or whatever the case may be. Um, in addition, they took advantage of that kind of class classroom visits notion, uh, and in fact. Uh, pr uh, approached about a thousand students, covered about a thousand students, and gave them information. Um, again, in the in kind of the last uh, few, you know, maybe week or so, or depending on where you are, um, before the voter registration deadline, um, you know, in case there's, you know, again, so I know there's been some great work done already. If there happens to be. Um, some more voter registration going on. We have a great toolkit piece with uh, some best practices. Hopefully, taking advantage of it, of it so far. Uh, but if not, it's there at our toolkit. Um, we're talking about a very you know short and intense period. A good way to, to really kind of organize activities. Um, you know, and focus the energies. Uh, you know, figure out ways to hand out door dorms. Uh, excuse me, hand out forms. Um, you know, either door to door in dorms um, or you know at the beginning of class or in dining halls or the kind of main campus walkway, just whatever um, is, you know, we're, there are just a lot of students congregated. Um, you know, encourage students to work together in a coalition, you know, in addition to student government, you know, college Democrats, college Republicans, um, other clubs. Um, here in D.C. where I am, Democrats and Republicans may not be getting along all that well, however, um, at the campus level, uh, we've seen a lot of really great work, coalition work. Um, between different politically minded organizations, just deciding that it's really important for young people to have a voice. Um, you know, just a, one example, uh, uh, you know, the University of Oregon was able to, you know, kind of negotiate some reasonable hours during the day um, where they could do a, you know, a dorm storm. Uh, just for a short period, administration was, was comfortable with that and it ended up being a really successful registration effort. 
Um, if you go again to our resources page, fairelectionsnetwork.com, um, you'll see a, a great set of voter registration guides that lay out basically all the questions you might have about you know what is it, what are the requirements for doing third-party registration? You know, do you have to notify? Secretary of State, uh, you know, do you, which application can you use in, G, in the GOTB period? Can you can you photocopy complete information, or do you have to black out some some personal data? So just uh, all of those questions, you'll find that we have for for basically every single state in which there somebody can do a voter registration drive. We have it up on our website. Um, again, the next uh, the next kind of item we're we're, we're having some. Uh, some great luck with is um, integrating voter information into a school website. This is a, a really great toolkit item that is especially important in the last few weeks before the election when, when students are really going to start to pay attention. Um, this is just one example, maybe possibly from the, I think from the last election cycle um, at the University of Wisconsin. Um, there's been kind of a you know complicated legal back and forth on the state's voter ID law. So it has a piece here, just kind of you know where to determine you know where does that stand. Um, uh, before, you know, when it looked like the ID law would be in effect, but it's not, uh, you know, got these posters to kind of tell students about, um, you know, just raise awareness about it, uh, you know, a video featuring the, the school mascot, showing them how to get the documents they needed to get ID. Um, below the screenshot, you'll see a list of dorms, and um, uh, basically next to each dorm, a map to the precinct, the polling place for that dorm. So it's so you know this this website it has a lot of great information that's that's kind of good for voters generally, but also particularly hits on the issues that are most important to student voters. Um, we're also encouraging uh, colleges and and again a, a ton around the country have done this. Uh, Turbo, a company called TurboVote, you know, has a great re voter registration widget um, that will allow. A student to kind of pre-populate a form online. Uh, this is if the free, you know, the free version. There's a more comp there's a expensive version or uh, a a version that costs money. Excuse me, I don't. I would call it expensive. Um, in which uh, you know, there's kind of a whole mail program where everything will get mailed to you with self-addressed stamped envelope. But if you want to make a pitch to schools that that you know they don't have to spend money, there's a free version that allows a student to pre-populate a form, uh, then print it out and mail it in. Uh, but kind of the most important part of this is that it, it collects whatever contact information the student wants to give uh, to TurboVote so that they can just be reminded of important dates. You know, you know, do kind of a bit of a chase. That you know, to see, you know, get an email. Hey, you know, did this registration go through? Um, everything goes smoothly. Uh, early voting's coming up. Uh, make sure, you know, uh, here's an absentee uh, ballot deadline. Those sorts of things. So it's a really useful tool to kind of. You know, keep make sure students are to, are reminded about the information they need for the election, um, and and kind of the second part of doing a, a student voting website. Once you've created something, uh, a really useful tool is to make sure that students can actually find it. So to put links throughout the school website where they're actually likely to see it and click on it. Um, so, so figure out you know which pages students frequently visit. Uh, it'll be probably be different on every campus, but class registration, Blackboard, Moodle, or whatever. Um, uh, kind of class management software your school might use, textbook orders, just think expansively. Um, the next item, which is, you know, kind of important for GOTV at the very end, uh, is uh, getting students to the polls. You know, there may be places where a school um, does not have an on-campus polling place, and it can be incredibly useful to uh, figure out ways to transport students there on election day. Maybe, uh, you know, to kind of see if administration will let you take over um, the shuttles that typically take students around campus, um, you know, and use them for the day to, to take them to a, a couple of the closest polling places. Um, other options is just an awareness campaign around public transportation to let them know uh, what's the best way to get to uh, particular polling places from campus, uh, maybe organize carpools among students. Um, so there are a few ways to go on this. Maybe just making sure that distance to the polls doesn't, doesn't uh, act as a barrier to student participation. Uh, next toolkit item is get ID, making sure students have the ID they need to vote. Um, you know, this issue seems to just get more complicated with it with every passing day. Just in, in today in Pennsylvania, um, a judge overturned a, a voter ID law uh, that would have required um, you know taking some sort of photo ID. Um, and in Pennsylvania, a, a, a student ID would have been allowed, but it would have required a um, an expiration date. Um, but anyways, that's no longer in effect. So. 
you know, one, what's required in your state? Uh, again, at fairelectionsnetwork.com on our resources page, we have a ton of, um, of ID guides um, or in, on the student voting guides, we put ID requirements and, and discuss how student IDs fit into those ID requirements. You know, uh, pitch the idea of, of having administrators or student government, you know, send out our guides or the information from it or we'll, or we'll help you. Um, you know, put together what, what the best information could be in one in one last email that could go out to all students. Um, in in some states, schools can actually do the work of producing the ID documents that students can actually use to vote. So, uh, you know, we can help you figure out if that's the case in your state. Um, one example of that is Ohio, uh, a place in which uh, they non-photo ID can be used as voter ID. So, you know, you can either use a photo ID or you can just or take a handful of other documents. Two of those documents include either a letter from a government agency or a utility bill. So what public colleges have done in Ohio uh, is written short letters to students uh, with their with their current address on it, uh, name and current address, and just confirming that they're students and saying that they can use this um, as voter ID, which is which uh, is consistent with the ID law. At public uh, private colleges in Ohio, um, they just, they're, they're, they can't use the government letter route, so they decided to issue zero balance utility bills. Um, they're writing to dorm students. Uh, saying, again, with their name and current address as the law requires, and saying, uh, you, you know, you paid this semester's dorm fees, uh, which includes electricity, water, uh, whatever, uh, cable, um, you owe nothing on your utility, and that could be used as voter ID. So, so figure out if there's something that actually, based on state law, your school can do. Um, you know, also at uh, at the toolkit at campusvoteproject.org, you know, just some basic some some help for organizers. Um, you know, you're you're getting some um, some great kind of on the ground uh, practice right now. I'm sure you're learning some amazing stuff as you go. But we we also have kind of tried to put together some some useful tips uh, from people who have done this kind of work before. Um, just advice uh, for meeting with administrators, election officials, you know, the kind of just uh, to get you thinking about what questions do you want to do you need to ask, you know, what what goals do you want to accomplish when you're going into those meetings. Um, also just some basic email templates. Uh, it has ways to it has how to introduce yourself to election officials and introduce what you're uh, trying to do in order to uh, get a meeting with them. Um, a, we have a great media guide, a, a very experienced communications manager who wrote uh, just just again kind of the basics on incorporating local media into your campaign, be it the basics of writing an op-ed or letters to the editor, um, calling you to radio show, putting together a press list, um, all really useful stuff. So you can check that out. Another toolkit item is how to build a coalition on campus, and just the things you need to think about um, when you're getting groups to work together, when, when you're working with uh, with other groups, you know, what your, your different goals are and um, how those are going to fit together and you know, just the things you need to think about to have a successful partnership. Um, you know, I want to kind of go over the basics of, you know, a lot of the questions that, um, you know, that, that we hear a lot on college campuses about just basic students' rights. Um, you know, can, can students vote in their college community? And the answer is a resounding yes. Um, uh, in 1979, the Supreme Court held that students had the same right to vote in their college community um, as non-students. Um, that's really important for, for students to recognize. Uh, it really comes down to intent, uh, where you intend to make your home for the time being. Um, you know, it, it's really, you know, as long as a student lives there presently and doesn't intend to return to their prior residence, then the, the, they can establish voting residence locally. Um, again, it's, you know, it's really for the time being, not forever, not until, uh, not even until you, uh, you know, after, after you graduate, and just for the time being. Um, and again, important, another important question, uh, you know, out-of-state tuition is, is irrelevant to voting residents. Those are separate legal questions. So people who may be paying out-of-state tuition can still establish voting residency locally. Um, however, if you encounter students that, you know, want, want to explore some other options, um, again, you'll find this information in our get out, state-specific get-out-the-vote guides um, at fairelections.work.com on the resources page. Um, you know, you're going to want to determine, you know, is an excuse required uh, in your state or the state they want to vote in. Um, in most states, being out of the community due to being a student is a valid excuse in states that require an excuse at all, it's not, which is not all of them. 
Um, for for out of state students who want to vote back home again, you know, it's going to be essential to check what the requirements are of the state, um, and in particular. Uh, as students are often first-time voters, uh, does that state require first-time voters to vote in person? Um, or if not, may maybe they'll have to submit an ID with their absentee ballot application. So, so again, you can look to our GOTV guides to get some information um, on that. Um, again, uh, you know, as I mentioned, students being often first-time voters, uh, um, either you know the, in your state there may be rules requiring them to vote in person they may not have an absentee or mail-in option so just look into that um, it, however that may that may only apply to those who register by mail uh, or a registration drive it may not apply to those who um, uh, you know who register in person in the county office or something like that so so look into that I just want to kind of conclude with some of the you know the myths about student voting. Um, you know that really, I, I think, create a lot of misinformation and discourage some students from participating in the process. Um, you know, students aren't really part of the community and have to vote back home. Well, I, I think both uh, on a philosophical level and, I guess, more importantly for our purposes, a legal level, that's false. Um, you know, philosophically, students are, of course, you know, you you live in the local community, uh, work. You know, often work in local community, uh, have to abide by local laws, and pay local sales taxes. Um, so their students are certainly part, of, you know, ingrained in the local community. Um, however, on the le uh, as far as legal question, as I mentioned, this has been constitutional law since 1979. The Supreme Court said, you know, students have the same right to vote uh, and establish voting residency in a college community as any other member of that community. So that's just wrong. Um, registering your college community will affect federal financial aid. That is also false. Um, there is no effect where you register to vote on your ability to get federal financial aid. Um, there is, however, you know, you, there may be sort of instances which I've never heard of, but they could exist in which you have um, maybe a, some community grant or a scholarship from a state. Uh, you know, you may want to look into or whether that is affected by where you register to vote, but most people, you know, get federal financial aid and there's no effect. Um, registering in your college community will prevent your parents from claiming you as a dependent on taxes. That's also false. Um, for certain students who make over a certain amount of personal income, uh, which is, you know, not going to apply to very many students, it, you know, there may be where a person establishes residency may be one of many factors that affect uh, the ability to be claimed as a dependent, but certainly doing it just by itself for just your average student um, period is wrong. Um, and lastly, registering your college community will prevent you from being on your parents' health insurance plan. Uh, that's, uh, that's also false. Um, as long as a student uh, can be we have one of the, the most of, like most of students, can be a dependent for tax purposes, they can stick on their parents' insurance plan. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to close out. Uh, just uh, you know, kind of a one more reminder uh, that you know that there's really important work that can be done in these last you know several weeks before election day, where where students are really tuning in, um, especially after this first um, debate um, coming up this week. Uh, and you know, we can help you develop a student voting website or get you know put in one place you know what could be a blast email to all students that either administrators or student government can send out. If you're doing any last registration efforts, you know, please use our guides, uh, both uh, our registration guides, GOTV guides, student voting guides that are all state specific um, that should be able to answer uh, most of the questions you might have. But uh, I'm also here personally to be a resource for you, so don't hesitate to give me a call um, at the number there um, or, or send me an email. Um, you know, uh, follow us on Twitter to, to you know, please tweet at us any you know any exciting work you're doing so we can retweet and. You really share with uh, you know our contacts what you're doing, but um, um, yeah. With that, I will um, close out and um, turn it back over to uh, to the team. Dan, you've given us a lot of really helpful advice. If you could offer just one piece of advice to students going forward in the next week, what would it be? Make sure students know they can vote, uh, register and vote locally. That's you know there's just a lot there's a great deal of confusion about that, and I, you know I really hope that all students are aware are aware of their basic right to participate in the community in which they live. Thank you. 
great. If no one has any other questions, I'd like to thank Dan for redoing this broadcast for us. We appreciate your time and your energy and your help. And as he said, he is available for our resource for all of you. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Okay, so